So, okay, let's start again. Uh, so, we are going to use the model view separation principle now. And this is a fundamental <laughs> structuring of interactive software. Uh, I think most of you have been doing interactive software because you have a human uh, at one end uh, receiving some kind of events and having a, in, an interface to, to affect the system, so to speak. And this can be a very simple interface, of course, as in a console application, or it can be a really complicated interface uh, as in some graphical uh, user interface. So the, the principle says that you should divide your application into two parts. One view part, that is the user interface, the presentation of, of information, the input from, from the user, the ways to interact with the system. And you should have another part that is the domain or business rules the part that actually fulfills the requirements, the functionality of the system, so to speak. So we have one part with user interface and one part with requirements. And you are to have no dependencies from the model to the view. And you are to have no business rules in the view. So you are not allowed to put any requirement fulfilling stuff into the view and you're not to, uh, allowed to have code in the view, uh, code in the model call code in the view, because then you add a dependency. So any idea why we, will, why we would like to have this separation? Why has this become so important, so it even becomes a, a principle to, to abide in? Interactive software is quite, quite a large span of types of software. And uh, this seems to be, yes, we have uh, reusability here. Uh, yes. <coughs> it enables at least easier reuse of the domain and business rules. Because we can take the business rules and we can implement a new user interface for them. So we can take the business rules and ship them to another customer that has whole or parts of the old system in it without having a lot of user interface code in, in the model that is maybe specific for a certain type of, of user. Collaboration. Indeed, it, implementing a good user interface, it is not that easy. It often requires specialists in user interfaces, both from the technical standpoint and from a usability standpoint. Code in user interfaces, the, the amount of code in user interfaces is, is often not uh, small. It is uh, often at least uh, as big as the number of lines of code in, in the model for a fairly complicated a graphical user interface. So we have a lot of code in the view that is specialized. And we probably also have a lot of code in the model that is specialized. And we need experts that really understand the, the problem domain. So it is not maybe that smart to have a, uh, a, a coder that uh, really knows insurance systems to make him code a graphical user interface, it is not the best way to organize your project. Yeah, so we have reuse, we have collaboration, efficient development, better use of resources. We can allocate experts to their area of expertise in a more uh, efficient way. Do you uh, know how stable graphical user interface technology is? So how often does graphical user interfaces change? We get new technology there quite often. Different frameworks, different technologies come and go. And this is also what is presented to the end user. So end users sometimes at least want the latest user interface. 
oh, we want this to work on a phone now. We want this to work using Bootstrap, or we want this to work using something else. Well, who knows what, what the next flavor of the month will be. So we have a lot of uh, evolution going on in user interfaces. Over, a, for example, a five or 10 year, 10 year span that the system lives, well, user interface technology is going to change. And if we want the system to still be competitive, it needs to evolve. So we would like to facilitate this evolution. And by changing the user interface, we would not like changes in this user interface to affect the whole uh, system. So if we can keep this integrity, the domain or business rules need not change. Because insurance works pretty much as insurance did 10 years ago, probably. Of course, you can have evolution also here. But uh, evolution from the technical side is often faster. A view can act as a different layer. Yes, you can, you can, you can see the view as a, some kind of a platform layer if you want to. So while we would like the model to be platform independent so that we can have it on multiple platforms, the graphical user interface is often platform dependent. So we have different user interfaces for different platforms, but the same code for the uh, business rules for the actual functionality. So an example. We will make a small example. Let's imagine we are making a, a, a math program. And this math program is about circles. And we are going to calculate different things about circles. For example, the area of a circle, or the circumference, or something like that. So we have this circle concept. What do we need to calculate the area of a circle? What the information is needed? <laughs> the radius? <laughs> and then we can do our get area. Uh, this will probably be some quite simple calculation, just uh, the radius squared multiplied by pi or something like that. And we can add other mathematical stuff to this. So we can add the circumference that I'm not going to spell out because that's impossible. So this is, this is basically what we need to, to solve the, the problems in our application. Uh, because it's a math application, and we want to calculate areas of circles. But then we want a graphical user interface. We want these circles to be displayed nicely on, on a screen. Maybe the user can click and select and drag and uh, adjust the radius interactively. What kind of information do we need now? Yes, we need some kind of position. So I will just write down position. Probably maybe the center position of the radius, so that we know, OK, this circle is positioned at this point on the screen. Do we need anything else? So we have the positions of circles, and we have the radius. So we can kind of like, OK display them on the screen in, in, uh, in different positions. Anything else you think is needed? Color. Color is a good thing. So we can now have different colors on our circles. 
Anything else? Well, we could imagine maybe both a, a line color and a fill color. So we can have fill color. So now we can have filled circles with different line colors, at different positions on the screen. Anything else? Well, maybe they are going to have some kind of a, we need to know if the circle is selected or not. Has the user selected this, this circle or is it not selected? So we add a lot of attributes here. We add a lot of information for each circle. And do we need uh, any other functionality, you think? Well, we probably need to draw it on some kind of screen. So we add a functionality for that. Drawing the circle, using the position, the color, and the fill color, and maybe the status, if it is selected or not. And we need some kind of a representation, at least, of, of the actual screen we have, so that we can draw it on, onto something. Uh, anything else? Well, we probably need some, some form of event handling, because the user is supposed to be able to click on it. So what, let's just do mouse click. So if the user clicks, we send in a position to all our circles. And if this position is inside the, uh, the circle, it is becomes selected or deselected if it already was selected. Well, basically, that's. Maybe that's about it. So now we have our nice our nice new circle. And as you see, this functionality that we had to start with, the get area only operated on the radius. But as we added this user interface code, the class got really, really bloated. We added a lot of attributes to handle the user interface. And we added a lot of operations, or a lot, at least two operations that we could find. And these operations are, well, compared to the get area, they are quite complicated. So this is what can happen if you violate the model view separation principle. So we have mixed responsibilities. We mixed user interface code with requirements code into the same class. And what happened? Well, the class become, became bloated. It became complicated. And actually looking at it, it got dependencies also. So this is screen here. What is that, actually? Well, we have some kind of user interface library here. And this screen probably comes from this <coughs> user interface library that defines how, OK, the screen is made up out of pixels, and you can put colors on pixels and basic functionality for drawing and stuff like that. And possibly also these colors are defined in this graphical user interface library. And this mouse click event handling, well, maybe that also comes from 
implementing something in the user interface library. So we, we got a lot of dependencies from this class that were, that were added. So next time, we are going to write a mathematical application. It's going to have a console-based, a batched-based user interface. That is, you s s d supply a file with a lot of radiuses. And then you want the total area of all the circles in that file. And we are immediately thinking about, well, we did a math application a while back. So let's take a look at that circle and reuse it. And we take this class and we copy it into our new project. Is it going to compile? Probably not, because you have dependencies on the graphical user interface library now. So suddenly you need to add a graphical user interface library to your batch processing program. And maybe that's not a good idea. Because this user interface library probably evolves, becomes new, and that is good for your graphical user interface math application. Because you have better features, faster. But it's not good for your batch processing program, because you need to maintain that now also. When this evolves, you need to maintain that old program that is not actually needed. Yeah, we can have get and set color. Of course, we, we need to have, have, have this. And, and we need to change the position, probably. So we can add, add a lot of operations here that actually has nothing to do with circles, but has everything to do with the graphical user interfaces. So as you see, mixing this uh, in this way is not a good idea. And the way you should do it is, is of course, to, to um, abide by the principle. And you maybe should do your circle. Your circle cast. This is something that is quite generic. Well, circles, they have areas. You can reuse this without problem. And you are going to have your graphical user interface circle and some kind of dependency here so that the graphical user interface circle can use the radius from, from a circle object and display it on the screen. Makes sense? And here you can add all the goodies you need in your user interface and you can let your GUI library expert code this part. Because these APIs are often not that easy to understand and know. And you can have your math guru do the circle calculation. This is basically what the model view separation principle is about. So let's just add a big. Don't do this. Because chances are you will end up with a complicated solution that is bloated, that is hard to reuse, it's hard to divide labor, it's hard to have two coders in, inside the same class, because that often means they are inside the same file. And well, sure, you have versioning and stuff like that, but it it's prone to get, um, you're prone to get conflicts when merging and, well, things will get worse for you. So, a little more uh, practical example. I have uh, worked on the, the dice game application. Uh, it it kind of like now looks like this. It has a way better user interface. Actually, it has because you can play the game multiple times now without restarting it. And you get a, 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 
a good um, instruction at the top. And you also get the uh, actual faces of the, of the die. So you know that, OK, the first die displayed one, and the other one six, and that made me win. Fantastic application, and you can type Q to quit. So we have added some user interface code to this very basic dice game you had. And looking at the, the, uh, the user interface, it is uh, put in main. It's put in the main uh, class, in, in the program class, in the main function. The, this is the startup of, of this application. In C Sharp, it looks like this. In Java, it looks somewhat slightly different. In C++, this startup looks uh, in another way. So this is quite language dependent. Uh, basically, we use the console as the GUI library. So it's not a really complicated, but uh, it's more of an example. But if you take a look at this, this program class, it kind of like does a lot of things right now. It is the main startup of the application. It creates a dice game object. It holds information for the user interface. It executes the, the game, collects the result, and updates the user interface again. So we can zoom it in. So while it, uh, it is not that much code, the structure here uh, leads us into a path that is not that good. Because, well, we add more and more functionality to our dice game. Maybe we're going to save the games, the result of the games. And oh, we put this here. And user interface for retrieving saved games and stuff like that. So we need to uh, use the model view separation principle to uh, get a better distribution of responsibilities in this case. Even worse would be to add, for example, here in the play operation, add some console out. Because then we would have added user interface code into our nice dice game class and started this bloating of the dice game and making it hard to reuse. I will try to zoom in in different places. So the principle says we should have a view and a model. So let's uh, create that. And we do that by adding folders, view, and model. So, and we know that, OK, the actual business rules are going to be put into the model. So we move the dice and the dice game into the model. to say that they also reside there. Oops. <laughs> it's too bad that it does not seem to remember the zoom between windows. Um, something like this. And So let's just try. Uh, right, so it works. Seems to be working at least. Oh. Yay. And let's create a new view. So we want to move all the responsibility of the user interface into a new, new type. Uh, in the view package. So we make a new class, and well, why not just say console player?
the user interface code into this operation. <coughs> Something like that, I think. And out here in the program, we need to create a view. better game so <coughs> basically we created the structure the view and the model we moved the business rules fulfilling types into the model and we created a new type a new class called console player and put the user interface in it and then we let just the program be responsible for starting the application and letting uh, letting it run so this type becomes much more focused on doing what it needs to do no user interface well the console player becomes focused at well I'm a user interface for a console so I need to do a lot of system console write line and uh, read key and stuff like that and execute tell the the model what to do in this case it just calls play And we don't have any user interface code here. And not here. So now we have restructured or refactored our program to, to be more like a uh, model view separation. We can now also write other kinds of user interfaces quite easily. If I would like to translate this, for example, in, into uh, Swedish or something else, I could just write a new class here, maybe use the console, maybe use some other graphical user interface, and maybe um, and not need to change the model side of things. It's the same game. So in this way, we gain a lot of flexibility. So I will put this, of course, on the uh, uh, GitHub repository. And you are free to, to add your own uh, implementations in other languages. We had a, a good amount of implementations in, for the first application and uh, would be cool to see other implementations also. Uh, actually, one, one thing to notice is that uh, if we look at the first lecture we did, let's see if I can find that. Uh, I should be able to find it here. I actually cheated when we did this. Because we did this already. When we did our sequence diagram, I don't know if you remember, we put this little dude here and we called him player. And I said that, OK, this is the user interface. And then we did the domain modeling uh, up here. And then we translated this into a model that fulfills the requirements does not mind any user interface code. So we kind of like, I kind of like cheated this and used the principle of, of model view separation from the get-go. And this is quite common that you kind of like, when doing the uh, domain layer or the business rules layer, you 
don't think about the user interface. The user interface just drives this layer. In this case, we called him player after the actor also. And that is also why I, I named it console player in uh, the implementation. So, OK. Let's uh, make a new class diagram then. Ooh, I could use different colors, maybe. Oh, this is this is a bit messy. So, what uh, what classes do we have? Should we look at the implementation? You can see here we have a dice class, we have a dice game class, we have a console player class. That's basically it. Hi, I have a question here with only read access from view to model. Uh, not in, in the uh, uh, model view separation principle, at least. There is no, no mentioning of this uh, in this principle. You, you can, uh, if you use other patterns for, for this, you can have this rule or you cannot have it. It's, it's more or less up to you. And looking at, looking at the, uh, this implementation, you can see that, well, as the, the view calls play, and play changes the state of things inside the model, it is not uh, a, a read-only uh, implementation right now. So we have dice, dice game, and console player. So let's just write them down. Do you remember how these are connected? Are the dice and the dice game connected in some way? They are. How are they connected? Yeah. Dice game call, calls, uh, a dice game object calls functions in, in two different dice objects. So we ha have some kind of dependency some kind of relation between the dice game and the dice. Do you remember how this looks? What does this look like? Well, we can take a look at the implementation to start with. We can always look at the implementation. And we can see, OK, we have two member variables properties or what they are called in C-sharp, I have no idea. But we have two member variables, md1 and md2. And these are the objects that are being used. They're being rolled and they're being get valued and, and stuff like that. So this means we have an association. You can always look at the uh, member variables. And if you have a member variable to another type, you have an association. So how many associations do we have? <coughs> well, we have two. And when doing design, the directionality or navigability is important because we need to know that the dice game is dependent on the dice, not the other way around. And it is so by having a member variable or attribute called md1. And this has another one called md2. So 
consequently the dice is, is easier to reuse. It does not have any dependencies to anything else in our application. If we would like to reuse dice, we could just copy it and use it directly. So, taking a look then at console player. Do you remember anything about the console player? What does, does it do? Yeah? Yeah, it presents the result. Where does it get the result from? Dice game. So we have some kind of dependency or relation between console player and dice game. And we can take a look at the implementation once more, if I can find it. There we have it. And we can look at console player. And, we, and it does not have a member variable of type dice game. Rather, it has a, an argument to the play operation that takes an object of type dice game and calls it a game. And then it uses this game to play, it uses it to get the dice values, and so on. So, we don't have an association in this case. In this case, we have something that is called a dependency. And this just looks like this. A dashed arrow. So basically, if you have a member variable property, or what you call it in, in your implementation language, and then you have an association with the role name, the same as the variable name in the design. If you have an argument to an operation, in this case we had a dice game object that was sent in to the play operation in the console player, then you have a dependency. Can you find any other situations where you can have dependencies? Creating instances, exactly. Instead of sending in the dice game object, we could just have created it in the play operation. We could have made g equals new model dot dice game. And created an instance, and it would have been used, and then it would have been thrown away at the end of the operation. So that is another way to get a dependency. So we have, you can send in arguments, you can create objects, any other ways? Well, you can get objects as return values. You could, for example, imagine that, well, okay, we have the, the dice game here in play, and by calling get dice one or something like that, you get a dice object returned, and then you ask this dice object get face value or get value or what it was called. So then we would be using a, we would not be creating an instance, but we'd be using the instance that we get from another object as a return value. So this is a third way of getting dependencies. And there is a final way. You can have global variables. You can have a global variable of some type, and if you use that type, you will get a dependency to it. As you probably know, global variables are not that good. So avoid having global variables. And the same thing about static operations and static uh, objects. If you use a static operation in some type, you get a dependency to that type. So basically, if you use 
in some way another type, you get either an association or a dependency. If you have member variables, you get an association. The other cases are dependency. These are uh, two things you need to, to remember. You need to differentiate between associations and dependencies, and you need to be able to draw the correct arrow in the correct situation. Because if you do a, not a dashed line when you mean a dashed line, the diagram changes. It changes what you mean. There are two other situations that we need to remember also, but I won't be talking about them right now. So basically, you have four cases to remember. So this is how the design looks right now. And if we are to uh, uh, add some information also to this. Uh, ooh. We can also add the packages. And that you do by just drawing kind of like this folder-like thingy. That says model. And for the view, well, then you draw the and you put your classes inside them. And we can also see here that, yay, this dependency arrow is, is pointing in the correct direction and not the, the other direction, because the, the view can be dependent on the model, but the model cannot be dependent on the view. So we can't have stuff in here calling stuff in the view. And this is maybe the, the easiest part to, to remember. The trickier part is to not put any user interface code here, especially if you have such simple user interface code as uh, HTML strings, for example. Echoing something in, in, in the model is, well, it's so convenient. Or building a, a visual representation of an object using some HTML with some, some spans or some divs and some something like that. It's so easy to add here. And you won't notice it, because you won't get this reverse arrow. So maybe we should even add the system console here. And we can see that, well, we had dependencies here. We're calling a lot of functions in, in system console, write line, read key, whatnot. And, well, we don't have any code of that kind here. And that is good, because it would not be, it would be a violation of the model view separation principle if we did get these dependencies to the user interface library. And that is quite, can be quite tricky, because sometimes that happens very, very invis invisibly. So you add just, well, we need this kind of information just to get the user interface running smoothly or better. And sometimes, well, we, let's add a color to the dice. Let's just add a color. It could be easier to display the dice in the view using this color. But you need to make a judgment. Is the color actually part of something that is executing the rules of the system? Well, no, in this case at least. Maybe you have a game where you have a red dice and a black dice, and you are actually going to separate them. 
in some way. Then the color could be part of the business rules. So it is not always easy, <clears throat> but the basic principle is don't add anything to the model that has anything to do with the user interface. The model should focus on executing the requirements, fulfilling the requirements. Questions? You could put this up on a, uh, on a more abstract level and just use the model package and the view package and then the d show that, well, the only valid dependency we have is between the view and the model packages. So you could draw the dependency arrow from, from the view package to the model package. In many cases, this is desirable because if we have a lot of types in here, you potentially get a lot of dependencies into the model and, well, you, you, you simply can't see the design if you add too much information. So in that case, it could be a good idea to say that, well, anything in, in the view can depend on pretty much anything in the model. Can you count your main class as a controller? I get an instance. No, not really in this case. In this case, the, the main class is just a startup of the application. Uh, it's a something that is necessary for getting things to run, mostly. In this case, we don't have a controller. We will talk more about controllers when we talk about the model view controller pattern. So uh, one, one more thing to notice is, is also that actually I did some increased encapsulation by not returning the dice game to the console player, but rather have the, the console player go through the dice game and hide the dice. This increases encapsulation so that the console player does not need to know anything about dices. It just needs to know that, OK, you win or you lose, and I can get two values. And this is also, also something that, well, as humans, we like encapsulation and, and hiding the details of, of stuff in a simple-to-use interface. So this is also something that you can think about when, when designing. So I get a question in uh, assignment number two. Can we use the model view controller, or does it need to be the model view? Well, the model view controller is one way of achieving model view separation. So you are free to, free to use the model view controller pattern if you want to. The important part for me is that you have model view separation. So you don't violate the principle, and you mix user interface and business rules in workshop two. And one way to achieve that is to use the model view controller pattern. Any more questions? All right, we have been looking a little bit more actually at the uh, detailed design also today. We have seen more detailed class diagrams. We have been talking about patterns. And well, we will pretty much continue like this. I will talk about something. We will try to implement something. We will look at it and uh, see how it looks in, in a diagram. Sometimes we will code first, do diagrams later. Sometimes we will do diagrams first and code later. So you will get a little bit of both. Uh, if there's nothing else, I'm done. Daniel is uh, waiting to get in, so thanks for now. <laughs>